could you talk about the stages of life in a man and the way you've regarded your own life as a way to live them? I wish I could quote for you the seven stages of life as defined by Shakespeare. That summed it up pretty well. And from mewling, puking infant to beslippered, slobbering, senile old man. That's the course most of us follow. Foredoomed to it, I guess. But uh, ideally, again, I think a man's life should progress from a, a wild and crazy and adventurous youth through a sedate and domesticated middle age in which we perform our biological functions of reproducing to a very modest extent. These days, none of us should have more than one child. Going from middle age into a free and liberated and wise and contemplative old age in which we should have something to teach the younger generations, but only if they come around and ask. Teach, not preach. Nothing sorrier than an old man who has nothing to say, nothing to tell us, no advice or wisdom to offer. A young man should be an adventurer. A middle-aged man should be a producer of useful goods for his fellow humans, and a good husband to a wife and father of children. And an old man should again be an adventurer in ideas. And if he learns anything, be not only willing, but able to teach what he's learned to the youth, men and women, the young men and the young women, and the children, at least those who have sense enough to want to learn something. If they can find an old man who has brains enough to teach them anything, which is the way the traditional cultures got by for about a million years. That's something we seem in danger of losing in our culture, where the old folks are simply discarded, kicked aside into nursing homes or Airstream trailers, well supported, most of them nowadays, in U.S. culture, but otherwise largely disregarded. And what I said of men, young men, middle-aged men, and old men applies with equal force to women or should. They too should go through those three great stages to live a full human life. And I think if you can live a full human life, that should be the life abundant for anyone. It should be sufficient. If we could live fully from day to day and throughout a lifetime, whether it's a mere 40 or 50 years or the full three score and ten of biblical times or even longer, a full and active and adventurous human life should be enough for anybody and should free us from the childish hankering for personal immortality. Which of us is worthy to live forever and eternally? Nobody I know. And what's the point of it anyway? If this life here on this wonderful planet we call Earth is not good enough for us, then what possible pleasure or satisfaction or happiness could we find in some sort of transcendental, eternal existence beyond time and space. Eternity, in that sense, is nothing but a moment, a flash. And we probably experience that brilliant flash of eternity at the moment of death. And then we get the hell out of the way. We have our bodies decently planted in the earth to nourish other forms of life. Weeds, flowers, shrubs, trees, which support the ongoing human life, the lives of our children. That seems good enough to me. Or maybe when I become a terrified old man, I'll dig out the Bible again and start babbling about a life beyond the grave. But I think largely that desire for immortality is based on fear, terrible fear of dying, fear of death, which comes from not having fully lived. If your life has been wasted, then naturally you're going to hate giving it up. If you've led a cowardly or paltry or tedious or uneventful life, then as you're near the end of it, you're going to realize that, if only unconsciously. And you're going to cling like a real coward, like a drowning man, to whatever kind of semi-life medical technology can offer you. And you're going to end up in a hospital with a dozen tubes sticking your body 
the machines keeping your organs going, which is just about the most horrible fate I can think of for any man or woman. Worst possible way to die. Better by far to fall off a rock while climbing a cliff or to die in battle. Can you conceive of a situation where it would be possible for a person with a terminal disease to use his or her body as a weapon in a battle? Well, I look forward to the day when somebody with a terminal disease is going to strap a load of TNT around his waist and be down in the bowels of Glen Canyon Dam and blow that ugly thing to smithereens. That would be a good way to go. Yeah, I think one should live honorably and die honorably. One's death should mean something. One should try to have a good death just as one tries to have a good life. And if it's necessary to die fighting, then that's what we should do. If we're lucky, we can die peacefully. But uh, few of us will ever live in such a world. There always will be something worth fighting for, and something worth fighting against. And that's part of the drama of the human condition. That's what makes human life so interesting, and so entertaining, so full of laughs, the fighting, the struggling, the friction. I don't really want to live in a peaceful utopia. From a personal point of view, the world we live in is just fine with me. Because there's so many things to laugh at and laugh about, so many things to admire and to love, and so many things to despise. The ideal world for a writer and one who whose emotions are alive, and one who wants something to think about and talk about.